Well, hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us uh, from various places around the world. You're very welcome today to our Exling tutorial, and we're privileged to be hosting Professor Ian Roberts from Downing College, Cambridge, who will be giving us insights into his research on comparative syntax and will be delivering today's uh, tutorial, How to Build a Language. So I'll pass you over now to our Exling Society Chair, Professor Antonis Botinis. Thank you, Kate. Well, today we have the pleasure to have with us Ian Roberts from Cambridge. Well, I'm so excited, Ian, because in my youth, we grew up with universal grammar, syntax, and all this. And uh, although linguistics has taken many directions in, in recent years, syntax is still popular. And the same is universal linguistics, which we have left it a little bit aside, uh, and particularly in phonetics, traditionally, we have been working with contrastive, trying to find differences among languages and not the common properties. Well, Ian has been a dedicated researcher and scholar published a lot of uh, textbooks, research papers, not only in syntax in the narrow meaning, but syntax in the re relation to other components of the language. And that is the tie together today, how to build a language. How to build, do we know how to build the language? Well, that is what we will discuss because all the time we have tried to analyze language. Well, it will be certainly an interesting presentation and discussion to follow. And then we will have the chance to ask or make comments and talk with Ian. Thank you for being with us today, Ian. The word is yours. Um, okay, thank you. Um, thanks very much for your um, invitation and the introduction. I'll just share my screen straight away. So can everyone see that? Yeah, that's great, Ian. Okay, actually, I've just realized something. I'm going to try a different share because there's a, sometimes a problem with PowerPoint. Um, I'm going to do it this way. Um, so it's, I, I'm not going to put it into, um, well, let me try from here. Um, yeah, it, there's a problem sometimes with the slideshow mode. So I'll just do, do it when, when the screen is shared. So I'll just do it this way. Um, okay, so my title, as you can see, is How to Build a Language, and I hope to be able to um, answer the question that was just raised in the introduction, actually, in a certain way. Um, so um, let me just begin by making a very simple and basic observation that anyone can make uh, if you've been exposed to more than one language, um, and that is how different languages are. So here we have... Um, at the beginning of this slide, a sentence in Mandarin Chinese. And um, of course, if you don't know Mandarin Chinese, there's no way you can make head or tail of this sentence. Um, of course, the first thing we would think of as Europeans or Westerners is, well, that's just because of the Chinese writing system, which is so different to ours. But even if we transliterate the sentence, as on the second line here, um, uh, still we uh, can't make head or tail of it. Um, the sentence actually means uh, Jiang San uh, ate an apple, basically. Um, and so Jiang San, you can see as a proper name. Again, you can't guess what any of the other words mean uh, in isolation. Uh, I'll come back to them in just a moment. Um, uh, my point here is simply to make the observation that from every perspective, from the perspective not just of the way the languages are written, 
but also the way they're pronounced, uh, their phonetics and phonology, uh, and the way the languages are structured, and of course the vocabulary, uh, languages differ in every single respect. Uh, and this Mandarin sentence contrasting with its English translation here, John ate the apple, uh, clearly shows that. Then what we have here, the next sentence in Chinese, um, is Ta Chi Le Sheme, with the <laughs> very badly pronounced, I'm sorry, um, is, um, uh, corresponds to the English sentence, what did he eat? And then the third sentence corresponds to he ate it. Um, so with these three sentences, you can perhaps begin to guess what some of the, um, some of the Chinese words mean. Chi means eat, shema uh, means what, pingguo means apple. Uh, it may be more difficult to guess some of the others. Um, uh, and of course here, what I've shown with the English examples is that we can represent, uh, given the way that English spelling is uh, so notoriously uh, unsystematic, um, here we can represent the actual phonological or phonetic um, uh, form of the sentences, which we could also do for the Chinese ones in principle, uh, similarly using the International Phonetic Alphabet, uh, but I haven't done that here. Let's just move on and look at these same very simple sentences uh, in some other languages. So, um, um, oh, sorry, before we do that, my next, uh, sorry, the next slide is um, still on Mandarin. And here now, um, what we have is a, a proper representation of uh, some parts of the structure of the sentence, or really a word by word gloss, as it's called. That's in this um, font here, um, an interlinear gloss between the original Chinese sentence given either in pinyin, that is the Romanized writing system or in the Chinese characters. Um, and uh, here we have the translation, which we've already seen. In the interlinear gloss, we have um, uh, something that translates every bit of the Chinese sentence, uh, word by word, or more precisely, morpheme by morpheme. So we have eat corresponding to qi. Uh, uh, the le element is a kind of aspect marker indicating that the action is completed. Um, and then we have a word which corresponds to one. And then we have something which is very difficult to translate into English. Um, uh, an element that goes in between numerals, such as one, and nouns obligatorily in Chinese, um, which is called a classifier. Um, and it just tells us what kind of thing is being counted. Okay. Um, so then, so now we see each each bit of the Chinese sentence translated, and so we get a sense. Of the sentence. For our other examples, we have the gloss he, ta, eat, chu, uh, le, aspect, and then shema, what. Okay. And what we can notice here is compared to the English sentence, what did he eat, the word for what. Um, does not come at the beginning of the sentence, as it must in a, in a question of this kind in English. Um, and then our third sentence, he, which I translated as earlier as he ate it, uh, ta chile, uh, here again we have the same word for he, the same word for eat, the same aspect marker, but you'll notice that there's nothing in the Chinese sentence that corresponds to it. Okay? Uh, it's just left understood. Uh, that's a very general feature of Chinese. Um, now let's move on, perhaps to a slightly more familiar language, uh, certainly since I'm speaking from Florence it is. Um, so um, we have the same sentences in Italian. La mangiata, she has eaten it, or he has eaten it. Ha mangiato la mela, he or she has eaten the apple. And che cosa mangiato, what has she or he eaten? Um, and here, uh, those of you who know French or Italian or Spanish, we're on much more familiar ground compared to Chinese, um, but still we can see some, some interesting features. So first of all, we have um, the word a, which corresponds to has, the word mangiata, which corresponds to eaten. Uh, the word for it is actually this L apostrophe at the beginning of the sentence. Uh, so we can see that that word is in a different position to its English counterpart. And there is no word corresponding to he or she. Um, 
In the second example, we have very much the same situation. Has eaten the apple. Uh, you can notice, though, that the word for eaten ends in an O here, but in an A in the first sentence. That's due to the, uh, um, the presence of the feminine pronoun in front of the participle eaten. Um, so again, something uh, uh, interesting. Otherwise, we have simply has eaten the apple, very similar to English, but no word for he or she. Um, and then finally, uh, what has she or he eaten? Um, we have, at least in some forms of Italian, kikosa, what thing means what. Um, and we can see that as in English, this interrogative word has to come at the beginning of the interrogative sentence, um, even though it corresponds to the direct object, which normally follows the verb. Italian and English are exactly alike in this respect. Uh, again, we see the missing subject. Um, moving on to Japanese, um, here we see again uh, missing material of various kinds. So we've just got the simple sentence, uh, he or she ate it, which can actually be uttered in, or translated into Japanese just as tabeta, which is the verb eat, tabe, and the past tense marker ta. So we just have the verb. It's just eight. Um, if we fill out the sentence with the subject and the object, uh, as in Tanako ate uh, uh, apple or the apple, um, we, have, um, the, um, we have this sentence in B, where you can see the order um, subject or topic, uh, object marked with the accusative case, um, and then the verb eight. Okay, so what we can see is that the order of elements is different in Japanese from English or Italian, or Chinese, actually. In all of those languages, we have the order verb before object. But in Japanese, we have the order object before verb. Now let's move on to something much more seemingly exotic and look at a language, an indigenous language of North America called Mohawk, uh, spoken um, in an area on, on either side of the St. Lawrence River um, on the border between the United States and Canada. Um, the, um, uh, there are currently about 3,000 speakers of this language, which is part of a, uh, a very large family of indigenous North American languages called the Iroquoian family. Um, the interesting thing about Mohawk, like many indigenous languages of North America, um, is that um, uh, a single complex word, extremely complex word, can correspond to an entire sentence of English or a more familiar European language. So here we have the sentence, he likes babies, which translates just as a single word, although we can break that word up into its components. So we have this first prefix, ra, which means he, the subject. Then we have another prefix, which actually corresponds to the object, babies. Then we have something which is just untranslatable. Um, then we have um, the verb, like, and then a final um, marker which tells us it's a habitual action. So that corresponds more or less to the present tense in English. He likes babies. And here we have, um, if we change babies to them, uh, what happens is that the original prefix for he changes completely. And we get a single prefix, which means he is the subject and they is the object. ending on the verb are the same as in the first example. So this corresponds to likes. But these are both single words corresponding to entire sentences. And now let's move south. Our final example is an indigenous language of South America, Kukuro. This is spoken in the province of Mato Grosso do Sul, in the interior of Brazil. Um, this So I hope that doesn't happen again. Um, I was, I can hear is generally good, so I was surprised by that. Anyway, um, as I was saying about Kuikuro, um, what we see in this language is, um, a, again, a lot of complicated verbs, but not quite as complicated as in a language like Mohawk. So here we have the sentence, he will hear me. And you can see that there's a first, uh, there's a complex verb which consists of the object, the root here, something indicating a punctual action, a single action, um, and then future tense. 
And then another uh, aspect marker talking about the kind of action. And then the subject. So what you can notice is that the subject comes after the verb in this language. And here we have, a, again, a sentence corresponding to uh, a single word. So this is, I am working, I work, and then there's something in continuous action. Um, so that little tour around several continents um, shows us, uh, gives us an idea of the extent of linguistic diversity that we can observe in the world. And this certainly goes well beyond what was traditionally thought in classical times or in medieval times or even early modern times uh, in Europe. Uh, we have by now a very good sense of the range of variation that exists among the world's languages. Um, and uh, of course, there is a task of documenting and in many cases, unfortunately, preserving uh, these languages, which is something which is actively going on. Um, and of course, that's worthwhile because uh, studying unfamiliar languages, especially uh, from uh, ethnic groups such as the Mohawk and the Kuikura, um, tells us something important about aspects of human cognition, culture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in itself, although we see a great deal of diversity, this doesn't necessarily undermine a universalist approach to language. It creates a challenge for a universalist approach, but it doesn't undermine it. Um, and I want to talk now a little bit more about uh, the universalist approach, so the opposite side of the end of the spectrum. Um, universal grammar uh, is something that we can think of as a kind of language instinct uh, common to humans. Uh, in fact, as many of you probably know, uh, the language instinct is um, uh, the title of a very well-known book by Steve Pinker, where this point of view is uh, put forward very well. Um, we can think of it as something which is um, a biological endowment of humans. So it's innate, it's something that is given at birth, somehow genetically encoded, unique to humans. There are no other species first few years of life. So um, uh, universal grammar and natural languages all have this, these properties. Uh, all, um, so the question we can ask is, well, if there is such a thing as a universal grammar, which is innate and unique to humans, uh, why do we have all these different languages? Okay. Um, well, we could pick up from uh, medieval thinking. Uh, the medieval philosopher Roger Bacon said grammar is substantially one and the same in all languages, despite its accidental alternations. Um, well, of course, that was much easier to state in the 13th century when very little was known about any languages outside Europe. Um, and as I've just pointed out, we now know that there's a much greater de degree of diversity than someone such as Roger Bacon would have suspected. Um, in more recent times, of course, the individual who's been most associated with the idea of universal grammar is Noam Chomsky, uh, who is still uh, alive and kicking. Uh, and he saw uh, universal grammar as basically a hardwired blueprint for language, hardwired in some sense into human cognition. Um, so universal grammar would be seen then as an ingredient in language acquisition effectively def uh, defining what is a, a learnable or acquirable language. It constrains the form that human languages can take, so it tells us what an impossible language is, although we've seen that there are a lot of possible different languages. Um, and it constrains the way in which languages can change over time, something I won't have time to talk about here. It's an important aspect of human cognition, something which um, perhaps uh, extraterrestrials would find interesting about us. Um, so um, Chomsky's language acquisition recipe essentially um, consists of saying that it's a combination of the, the mature language capacity of any human uh, who grows up under normal conditions um, is um, a combination of nature and nurture. So universal grammar is the nature part, uh, but of course what the child is exposed to in their environment in their first few years of life is the nurture part. Uh, so I grew up in England, therefore I'm a native speaker of English. If you grew up in Athens, you'd be likely to be a native speaker of Greek. If you grow up in Beijing, you'd be likely to be a native speaker of Chinese, and so on. Um, 
Uh, it was also pointed out actually back in the 60s by Eric Lenneberg that language seems to resemble other biologically mediated developments in that it seems to be subject to a critical period. That is, there comes a certain point in the development of the individual after which it's much more difficult for this capacity to develop naturally. And so if somehow the individual is deprived of the relevant um, uh, nurture, the relevant environmental stimulus, um, then the uh, ability would atrophy. Um, this, of course, is very, very difficult to prove in the case of language. Um, there are obviously ethical constraints on what kinds of experiments one can perform on small children. Um, and generally speaking, if a, uh, any human child in a normal environment is exposed to language, um, and if they're not, because they're exposed to language by being exposed to other humans, um, and if they're not exposed to other humans, the human infant will simply die because they're not capable of looking after themselves. So um, it's very, very difficult to actually prove this, but there are some cases of uh, feral children. Um, the most famous one, uh, or the best documented anyhow, uh, being this uh, girl, Jeannie, um, who, um, wh whose uh, father uh, brought her up uh, to the age of 12, um, uh, and by depriving her, by feeding her, but depriving her of any form of human interaction. She was essentially locked in a cupboard for the first 12 years of her life and not spoken to either by her father or by anyone else. Um, she was eventually rescued by the social services. This was in Los Angeles in the, around 1970. Um, and she was um, taken to uh, UCLA, to UCLA Hospital, and there, among other things, they um, tried to teach her English, um, which she succeeded in learning, but only partially, and persisted in making the kinds of mistakes in English which second language speakers of English tend to make, and which uh, native speakers tend not to make, uh, mistakes with things like inflections and so forth. So there's some evidence from uh, Jeannie that there is a critical period. So, um, Clearly, language acquisition is very, very important to the idea of universal grammar. And um, we can ask ourselves um, how children go about doing this. Well, one thing which is, uh, there's much to say about this, and I'm not an expert, so I won't go into detail. But one thing which is very clear is that children do not do it through imitation uh, of their, uh, the people around them or by being instructed. We know this from the kinds of things that children produce, which couldn't possibly be imitations. So things like um, regularizing irregular verbs, saying I hold it instead of I held. Or more interestingly, uh, perhaps an example like this, I want another one spoon. And the noun itself, which actually looks a little bit like a classifier of the kind we find in languages such as Chinese. Um, or um, saying no like juice, again, this pattern for negating a sentence by just putting a negative word at the beginning is very common across linguistically, but it's not how English does it. In fact, English negation is significantly more complex. Um, so these kinds of sentences give us evidence that children are not just imitating. They're essentially developing their own grammar. So we have this evidence for universal grammar. We have evidence of a critical period. We have evidence that children don't learn by imitation. Um, and uh, the simple fact that language is universal to all humans and not found in other species and is acquired very quickly gives us a good reason to believe in the basic idea of universal grammar. But then we come back to our question, which I demonstrated at the beginning, why all these different languages and, and uh, different systems? So that's the question we have to answer. Um, and we can begin to do this by looking at a different tradition in linguistics uh, from the Chomskyan one, although it's very closely connected, um, a tradition, the tradition of language typology that was uh, developed primarily by uh, jo Joseph Greenberg at Stanford University. One of the things that Greenberg did um, was simply compare the orders of elements in the sentence across a, a good number of languages. Um, and this is a, 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 an aspect of language typology which has continued. So um, what, what Greenberg basically observed is that there are two principal kinds of languages in the world with a certain amount of variation. There are languages which have the verb before the object, which is like English. Remember, I ate an apple. And these languages tend to have prepositions, as in in London, 
preverbal auxiliaries, so the auxiliary will precedes the verb that it modifies, and initial subordinators, so the word that precedes the, the sentence it introduces, the subordinate clause it introduces. Then there are languages which do everything the opposite way around. So the object precedes the verb. They have postpositions rather than prepositions. So they would say the equivalent of London in rather than in London. Auxiliaries follow the verb they modify and subordinating conjunctions follow the sentence that they introduce. Um, this may seem very strange, but this is how Japanese works, for example. So two could be the English gloss of a Japanese sentence. Uh, I, he, London in, live will, that thing. Um, and imagine saying that in Japanese. Um, um, the Greenbergian tradition is represented these days by an online database called the World Atlas of Language Structures, which I strongly recommend taking a look at, um, which has data from over 2,000 languages spoken all over the world for various features. Um, and, uh, and each feature comes with a map. So here's actually uh, a map uh, showing two features together, object verb order and postpositions, object verb order and prepositions, verb object order and postpositions, verb object order and prepositions. And what you can see um, is that object verb and postposition is very common, all the yellow squares, very common in most of Asia, for example. Um, and then VO and preposition is also very common, the blue circles, Europe, Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and parts of the Americas. And then the other two logical possibilities are extremely rare and dotted about for the most part. Um, so this <coughs> supports Greenberg's contention that OV and postpositions, VO and prepositions go together, although we can observe that there are exceptions. Here's another piece of evidence along the same lines. If we bring the subject into the picture, and think of very simple sentences with a subject, verb, and object, like John loves Mary. What we find is that of the six possible permutations, um, two are very common. So the English type of order is very common, but it's not the most common. But the most common is the Japanese type of order with the object before the verb. Then verb, subject, object is not uncommon, but not common. <laughs> and verb, object, subject is pretty rare. The other two possible orders, object, subject, verb, and uh, object, verb, subject, are very rare indeed. Uh, less than 1% of the world's languages show those orders. So here's another map from the World Atlas of Language Structures showing these. So here we have the blue circles representing SOV, here you see Japanese. The red circle representing SVO, here you see English and lots of European languages. Uh, the yellow circle representing VSO, and you can actually see that the Celtic languages on the fringes of Britain uh, are VSO, as are various languages uh, in the Pacific. And here you can see OVS and OSV, but you can barely see any examples of them. They're mostly in the Amazon, actually. Okay, so now let's sort of uh, extrapolate from, the, from Greenberg and the results about world order. Um, and um, go back to some of the things we looked at in our first examples. The differences that we observe around the world in the structures of the world's languages. So um, what I want to do is uh, suggest that um, uh, there are different building blocks, grammatical building blocks um, of language, which basically are in themselves kind of universal. So they represent aspects of universal grammar, but different languages combine these possibilities in different ways to give the results that look so different that we've seen. So one of these is word order, the options for word order that basically come from Greenberg, essentially. Another one is missing pronouns. Remember our Italian example where we saw that the subject was missing compared with English, or the Chinese example where the object was missing. Or the Japanese example where both of them um, How complex words can be, whether words can make up whole sentences, etc., as we saw from our book. How you do things with words. I'll, I'll concentrate here on how we form questions um, from declaratives. And finally, ways of marking subjects and objects. Okay, so I'll just take these five building blocks and show how we can relate those to what we saw at the beginning. So 
Concerning word order, let's say, for simplicity, that there are four options. There's the OV option as defined by Greenberg, and let's just call that A. That's what we find in Japanese. There's the VO option as defined by Greenberg. Uh, let's call that B. That's what we find in English and the Romance languages, for example. And then there are various mixed types. I'll just call these mixed type one, which is what we see in German and Dutch and Latin, uh, and mixed type two, which is what we see in Mandarin. I can say more about what those really mean if, in the question period if you want. Then missing pronouns. Here there are also four options. One option is any pronoun can be dropped and there are no substitute inflections. And that's what we observed in Japanese in particular, but it's also true for Chinese. Call that type A. Another option is that any pronoun can be dropped, but we have inflections on the verb that substitute for the pronoun. Uh, we saw that in Kukuro and various other languages have that. Call that B. Um, then there are languages which only allow subject pronouns to be dropped and they have substitute inflections. That's languages like Italian and Spanish, which is of course very similar to Italian. Uh, that's C. And then there are languages which don't allow pronouns to be dropped. That's the English term. So that's D. Concerning complexity of words, again, four options basically. One is that words can be more or less equivalent to sentences as we saw with Mohawk, call that A. At the other extreme, there are languages where words are almost never modified at all. They're extremely simple. Uh, that's well, a well-known feature of Chinese, so call that option B. Then there are languages which are kind of in between. Words get modified, but they can't be as complex as they are in Mohawk. Um, and these, these languages fall roughly into two types. Those where there's a certain amount of irregular inflection, which is true, for example, of English, and certainly true of German and Latin, as I'm sure many of you know. Uh, but even in English, uh, we have, for example, the past tense of eat, as we saw in our examples, which is not eated, but ate. Um, and then there are languages where inflection is completely regular, and that's basically true of Japanese. So in Japanese, we saw the past tense marker ta, and that is just the, part, the past tense marker for all verbs. There are no irregular verbs. So, and then looking at what you can do with sentences. Well, let's, there are some languages where word order can be very free for expressive purposes. There is, call that A. There are some languages where the word order is, is, um, is free, but the freedom is limited in various ways, and there's no special order for interrogatives. Japanese is like that, call that B. There are languages with limited freedom, but a special order in questions. That's what we see in German. There are languages with very little freedom, word order for expressive purposes, but a special order in questions. That's D, that's what we see in English. And there are languages with very little freedom, uh, expressive freedom of word order, and no special order in questions. That's E, that's Chinese. And then my final uh, uh, building block, this one's a bit more complicated, but bear with me. Um, this is what's called alignment. Um, so we can see this um, in, even in English with pronouns. So in English, we have nominative forms of pronouns like he, which have to be subjects. And they're subjects of intransitive verbs like run away or transitive verbs like see. And the object pronoun of a transitive verb is accusative. So we have her, but not she in object position. So that's called an accusative alignment pattern. Now there are languages, about 20% of the world's languages, which have a different pattern, where it's, if it was English, it would be like this. Okay, where you have the same form of, of, of a, a noun or pronoun as the subject of an intransitive and the object of a transitive. That's called the absolutive. And then a special form as the subject of the transitive. That's called the ergative. Okay. Draw your attention to it. And then we lost the connection. That uh, in Kuikuro, in fact, we have an ergative uh, pattern because this um prefix, the transitive verb here corresponds to me, uh, the object, subject is this, uh, but with an intransitive verb work, it corresponds to the subject. Okay? So that's an example of ergative alignment. Okay, now, and this is my last point, we can go through the languages and show um, how each one of them fits into the different building blocks. So let's begin with English. Remember the sentences we had really were, he ate it and what did he eat? 
So in English, we have SVO order, he ate it. The pronouns have to be, so that's B. The pronouns have to be there, that's D. We have a regular inflection, eight, C. We have a special order in questions. The question word has to come at the beginning of the sentence, uh, while objects normally follow the verb. So that's D. We have accusative alignment, which you can't really see here, but we've already seen that for English. So we can say then that English is B, D, C, D, A, okay? We look at Italian, it's very close to English, which isn't so surprising. It has SVO order. Uh, subject pronouns can be dropped. That's the difference with English. So we have C there. But then irregular inflections, special order in questions and accusative alignment, those are all like English. So Italian is B, C, C, D, A. If we move on to Japanese, we have S, O, V order, A. All pronouns are dropped with no substitute inflection, A. Regular inflection for tense, this top thing, D. No special order in questions um, uh, and accusative alignment. So Japanese is A, A, D, D, A. Mohawk, well, it's very hard to tell what the basic word order is, but it's probably on B. All pronouns can drop with lots of inflection marking, which we actually saw. Maximally complex words, free word order by and large, although the OP looks like the neutral order, and accusative alignment. So Mohawk is A, B, A, A, A. Kuikuro, O, V. Lots of missing pronouns with substitute inflections. Irregular inflection, expressive word order, and a special order for questions, which we didn't see, actually, but I assure you this is true. I have it on good authority. Um, and ergative alignment. So Kuikuro is A, B, C, D, B. And finally, Mandarin. It has the mixed order of type two, missing pronouns with no agreement, no inflections, limited word order freedom, I should say, sorry, and no special order in questions, accusative alignment. Mandarin is D-A-B-E-A. -E so now if we line up all the languages, we can see that they're all different, although I'll, you can notice that English and Italian are very close. They only differ regarding non-subject pronouns. Um, uh, the other languages are somewhat more different, both from each other and from English and Italian, reflecting the fact that none of these languages are historically related other than English and Italian. Um, but what we can see is diversity in universality. That's the important point. We define the building blocks in universal terms. And what happens is that each language puts the building blocks together differently to give the, the very different looking outcomes that we had. So that's the really key message. So then the answer to our question, if we've got a universal grammar, why do we have all these differences in different languages, is because we have universal building blocks which combine differently to give different outcomes. So that's my conclusion. Um, and so um, this reflects work that many of us around the world are doing, combining universal grammar with the study of cross-linguistic diversity. What we do is look at historical patterns, which I haven't talked about here today at all, geographical patterns, which we saw on our maps, how languages fit into aerial patterns. So for example, basically all the languages of the Indian subcontinent have OV order. Um, how children learn the building blocks, which I touched on. Um, and then very interesting questions, how elaborate the building blocks need to be. Of course, ideally we'd like them to be quite simple. Um, and are there any combinations which are impossible? So essentially, the conclusion is, if you have a pile of bricks, you can build um, a shed, you can build a house, you can build a cathedral, you can build very different things from the same materials. Uh, languages appear to be like that. And also, of course, if you put the bricks together wrong, your building might fall down. Um, and so the interesting question, the really interesting question actually is the last one, which combinations are impossible? And that's something, again, that many of us have been actively working on. Um, so um, that's it. I'll stop there. I ran over slightly. I'm sorry, this was partly due to uh, a connection problem. But uh, there's certainly some time left for questions, I hope. So shall I stop the share? Yeah, you can stop the share now, Ian. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Roberts. Um, so we'll open the floor up now for any questions that you might have. Um, 
please, if you could type your name into the chat box, if you do have a question, as I currently don't have the uh, raise hand function visible on my, on my version of Zoom. So just use the chat box, please. Uh, there is a raised hand, actually, from um, Nikos, I think. Okay, great. Fire away. Uh, no, not Nikos, sorry, it's Antonis, the Exling Society. Ah, okay, Antonis, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I have a small comment and a main question. Okay. The common is that in Greek, you have this, how shall I call it, pronoun topicalization, like uh, la manzato, la mela. Mm -hmm. It's exactly... Yes, it's exactly the same. In yes. Greek. I mean, yes. if I use Greek words, egrapse, right, to gramma, mm. wrote the letter, we say to egrapse. Yeah. But still, la mela. And in Greek, it's the same. It's an old, new information. I mean, if you say lam uh, manzato, uh, 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 the person knows what this la or lo feminaskinin is. Mm -hmm. So they must know there is a mela to be eaten. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, it's a topic comment relation. Just, just a comment to inform you that we have in Greek and um, a lot in Spanish as well, which is quite common. So my question now, I've been wondering many, many, many years. I mean, at the beginning of my study, my studies, I believed what I read. Uh, you refer to Chomsky, okay. Uh, uh, here a, co a comment and then comes the question. I mean to say a universal grammar or universal linguistics, it's a lot of components. Okay, Gra uh, syntax is one of them. And now comes my question. Learning foreign languages, I never had a problem with syntax. I have not studied syntax or anything. It comes just like this. But I have to try hard with lexicon, morphology, pronunciation, all those things. On the other hand, syntax in most language, languages is highly predictable. I mean, you have to put, there is, there is minimal variability. In many cases, zero variability. On the other hand, morphology, intonation, prosody, you, you have variability, distinctive variability. In morphology, you mm. say apple, apples. You say walk, walked, meaning different things. If we think narrow, if there is minimal variability, there is minimal distinction, which means syntax is hardly distinctive or have a low uh, distinctive load. On the other hand, we cannot communicate without syntax. We have to put the boxes in the right place. Yeah, so well, just, um... Yeah, on your comment about Greek in relation to Italian, of course, uh, as they say here, una faccia, una razza. And, um, Greek and Italian are, or well, Greek and the Romance languages are quite similar in a number of respects because they're historically related, quite closely related. Um, and of course, because uh, they've been in contact since classical times. Um, uh, but um, on your more general point, you're absolutely right that morphology in particular seems to be more variable and unpredictable across languages than, than something like word order. Uh, that does seem to be true. But of course, there is variation in word order, as I, as I showed. Um, and then the question is to catalog that variation and show what other things may go along with it, which, as I said, was really what uh, Greenberg did initially. And that has been kind of taken into 
uh, to some extent into the Chomskyan uh, tradition. Um, and of course, the, the one thing about any language, which is um, uh, unless um, you're talking about related languages, but as soon as you go to unrelated languages, the one thing which is completely unpredictable is the vocabulary. Uh, as we saw with that very first Chinese example, if you don't know Chinese, you're never going to know that chu means eat. Right? How would you ever know that? <laughs> so um, uh, you just have to learn vocabulary when you learn another language. Um, and um, when you're young, it gets harder as you get older. Um, but your basic point is right, that some syntax is um, more... Um, essentially more, more clearly rule governed in various ways than morphology. Morphology is rule governed, uh, but there's a, actually a considerable debate among linguists as to, uh, as to what those rules are and how similar they are to the rules of syntax. That's very much an ongoing controversy. Um, Thank I, you. Think that, yes. I think there was another question in the chat, actually. Um, yeah, we have one here from, one? from Zia. Oh, yeah. So, um, Professor Roberts, if you have eyes on that uh, question in the chat, just let me know. If not, I can read it out. Uh, no, I've got it. So, um, yes, it says, hi, thanks for the wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, my question concerns the complexity of case alignment. If more patterns are attested, does this impact the algorithm denoting the aforementioned building blocks? Um, yes, <laughs> um, that's a very good question, um, because um, it, it in a way goes beyond the particular issue of case alignment. Um, what we see cross-linguistically is these two basic patterns in languages which have case marking. Of course, then there are languages like English outside of the phenomenal system, or languages like Chinese, again, which don't have any kind of case marking. Um, um, but among languages which have case marking, we see these two alignments basically, accusative and ergative. But we also see various mixed types. Um, and there is, in fact, also a third type of language called tripartite, where the subject of a transitive, the subject of an intransitive, and the direct object of a transitive all have different cases. Um, those are much rarer, uh, but they do exist. Um, so um, we do need to somewhat complicate um, the, uh, the algorithm, if you want to put it that way, the building blocks. Um, that is something that um, applies, in fact, to all the examples I gave. Um, I, I was um, giving relatively simplified versions of things um, simply for, for the purpose of exposition to get the basic idea across. Um, but uh, the reality in almost every case is that there are various kinds of complications and subclauses. And also in many cases, something that's uh, very interesting that I didn't really talk about um, uh, is that um, you have implicational relations among options. Um, so, uh, well, we did see that a little bit. For example, there's a strong implicational connection between verb object order and prepositions on the one hand and object verb order and postpositions on the other hand. Um, but um, we see many more cases of implicational relations of that kind. And those are extremely interesting because those are certainly telling us something about how the, uh, how the whole system of variation is constructed. So, but uh, the, one, the very short answer to your question is yes, the reality regarding case alignment is, is somewhat more complicated than what I actually presented. Okay, brilliant. So are there any last questions before we wrap up for today? I think there's a hand there from Saki Take. Okay, go ahead, Saki. Yes, uh, Professor Roberts, uh, thank you very much for your tutorial and wonderful talk. And uh, I'm Saki Take and I'm a uh, graduate school students in Ochanomi University in Japan, and and I have uh, some uh, basic question, and and uh, I part of the principles and parameters approach in my class in the university, and I uh, I just think that the uh, the idea of, of the parameters that the uh, uh, like a uh, uh, in, uh, in the universal grammars, uh, some differences in, in the uh, languages uh, uh, came from the um, choice of the 
parameters, like uh, in Greece is the uh, head, uh, is the head initial, and Japanese is the head final, uh, for example. And I, mm, I guess that the parameter uh, the idea of parameters is mm, similar to your ideas of the uh, the combinations of the building blocks. So, what are some differences of the, these ideas? What are sorry? Could you say that again? Uh, uh, what uh, what are some differences between the the ideas of the building uh, blocks and parameters? Oh no, really. Um, uh, the, the notion of building block is really the same thing as the notion of a parameter. Um, I just wanted to introduce it in a, in a less technical way um, and also um, emphasize more um, the fact that it's the combinations of properties uh, that give rise to the differences that we see among the world's languages. Um, if you study uh, parameters, um, to focus just on one set of differences. So for example, the, the differences in word order between say English and Japanese, or the difference between Italian and English as regards um, uh, unpronounced subjects. Um, uh, but um, what I wanted to do was really focus on how a, a whole grammatical system, a whole language is a combination of these things. And the reason, that the, the reason that we observe such striking differences among the world's languages is because of the combinations of the differences. And so I thought the sort of metaphorical term of building block um, would be a better term to use than the term parameter, um, which um, is in itself doesn't really convey a lot, whereas I think the term building block is a more useful one. Uh, but you're right that really the technical term uh, if we're looking at these things from a theoretical perspective, would be perhaps. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Saki. Okay, so I think we'll leave the questions there for today. Um, again, we'd love to thank Professor Roberts for coming and, and giving his tutorial today. Um, just a reminder, if you haven't already, please do follow us on Twitter and you won't miss out on any of our events. And we'll also have this video and past tutorials uploaded onto our YouTube channel. So do subscribe there as well. Is there anything else, um, Professor Botinas, that you want to add before we go? Well, thank you very much indeed, Diane. Thank you. Well, the strange thing is that during your talk, I thought a lot of things, new things. Good. We would discuss them, but unfortunately you have to go now, right? Um, yes, I'm afraid I do, at least in a couple of minutes, yeah, yeah. But we will continue our discussion. Well, that's the meaning to to look in a new way to old things and mm -hmm. talk about the function of syntax. Why do we have syntax in the first place? And can't we put the words any way we like? <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, well um, yeah, as you said earlier, um, uh, you can't really have language without syntax. Precisely. It's impossible. Yeah. From this aspect, it is very, very important indeed. And I have mm. thought about your building blocks and how to combine them with intonation and prosody, but we, it's something we will discuss in the future. Okay, I hope so. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you all of you who came back to you, Kate. Yeah. Do you have Thanks. anything more to say? Thank you. I have nothing more to add. Just thanks again to everyone for coming and we hope to see you. We have another tutorial uh, on the 29th of April with um, Cynthia Klopper from Ohio State University and she'll be talking about cross-dialect speech processing. So please do join us again uh, towards the end of April, the 29th. Okay, thank you all. Have a great weekend. Okay, th thank you, bye. Thank you, Professor Roberts. Okay. Bye-bye, thank you, thank you. Bye. Bye everyone, thanks.